another episode of Turn Left. I am your host, Indiana's own Dana Black, coming to you live. Yes, all the way live from Black Girl Studios, where we talk about Indiana politics from the left side of things. Yes, I went on vacation. I needed some time to chill, y'all. Don't I, I know it's been almost a whole month since you, you I've been on the air. No worries, though. We're going to kick the show off right. But before I bring on my guest tonight, there are a couple of things that happen in the news. No, I'm not talking about the Orange Menace, who happens to share a birthday with me. No, no, no. I'm not talking about that clown. See, yes, we are both June 14th Geminis, but I use my powers for good. I'm not trying to be self-serving. I'm trying to help elevate all of us in this civic engagement world. I'm not stealing top secret documents, so I'm not talking about that guy. But a federal judge hears bid to block Indiana's ban on gender affirming care. The Indianapolis Star reports an attorney arguing in federal court Wednesday says Indiana's ban on transgender medical treatment for children and teens tramples on their rights and the rights of their parents. The American Civil Liberties Union of Indiana is asking a judge in Indianapolis for a preliminary injunction that would stop the law from taking effect July 1st. The group's attorney called the law a clear violation of parental rights. A law lawyer for the state said the legislature had the authority to decide children shouldn't be a part of what he called the grand experiment. The judge made no immediate rulings after Wednesday's hearing. You know, I, I find it interesting that the attorney for the state says that, you know, they have the right, the authority to decide that children shouldn't be a part of the grand experiment. But it seems like they're conducting their own grand experiment. You know, how many bullets can a kid dodge while they're in school? Huh? How many times can you go to the mall and not have to worry about getting shot? Because we already know that firearms are the leading cause of death for children. I mean, I, I, ain't, I ain't seen a transgender person harm nobody, not like that. Not on a regular basis. There might be somebody out there that's a little violent. I don't know. But we do know for certain that children in almost all 50 states have been harmed by firearms. Now, parental rights seems to be the, the tone of our state house when it comes to, I don't know, teaching black history. You know, oh, my kid, if a parent says they don't want their kid to learn that, you know, black folks were more than just slaves and that we were actually scientists, doctors. And despite, you know, systemic racism, we were able to rise above. It's, if a parent doesn't want to hear that, the state says the parent has the right. So the parent has the right to tell you what your child can ha have and read and see because they're banning books now, too. Right. But now you want to take away a, a parent's right to provide medical care, gender affirming care. And gender affirming care doesn't necessarily mean surgery or puberty blockers. It could be socializing differently by changing their name and assuming a different pronoun or dressing differently. It doesn't even have to be about what they put in their body or what happens to their body. But because simple minded people don't understand the nuances of gender affirming care, they only know what they've been told by some knucklehead who only believes that there are only two genders. I'm sorry. Go look it up. There are more. I know it blows y'all's mind sometimes. There are more. But parental rights, they go through counseling. They go through psycho psychiatric care, psychological care. They do all of these things before they make the decision to do anything to their bodies. But now they're taking that away. Not to mention, we also have intersex folks who do receive gender affirming care, who are no longer able to do that, who do it to normalize themselves. See, unintended consequences from idiots who think they know more about gender than science. And y'all, I know y'all keep asking me, y'all been asking me, I got some news for you. I'm just going to read what the Indianapolis Star puts out, okay? Former state representative Mark Carmichael announced Monday he will file for the Democratic Party primary to replace U.S. Senator Mike Braun. Carmichael, 73, is the first Democrat to announce a bid for the seat in 2024. 
Uh, he says we deserve better than to be represented by someone as mean spirited, blindly partisan and out of touch with the majority of Hoosiers as Jim Banks. His attacks on innocent LGBTQ plus children for purely political gain are disgusting. And his vote against certifying that Biden the, certifying the Biden election uh, and dishonest rhetoric on Fox News after the election helped lead to the riot at the U.S. Capitol on January 6th. So real talk, I don't know who he is, but he's saying the right thing in his 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 uh, press release. So you know me, I'll try to find him next year because you know it's municipal year. I will do my best to see if I can find him and get him online. I will do everything I can. But in the meantime, y'all stay. I don't want to say stay woke because. They have, you know, occupied that word. Stay aware of what's going on around the world. Stay aware of what's happening in your state house and stay aware of what's happening um, in, in our courts because our courts are not, they don't end. They go all year round, okay? So find out what's happening and stay on top so that you can be aware. And as always, I get so excited. Bones Unique Boutique is my sponsor. Today's show is brought to you by Bones Unique Boutique. Click on the QR code. And for all Turn Left listeners, you can get a 10% discount on your order by using the code DEMOCRAT. Be sure to visit www.bohmsuniqueboutique.com. I love it. And I cannot thank uh, the Bohms up in District 3 for everything. We were up there last Wednesday or last Thursday for the show. Had a chance to interview a whole bunch of candidates who are running for office up in District 3, Allen County and all the counties in District 3. They are really doing amazing work up there. They always make sure they fill, fill their slate in Huntington County. Even in small counties where people don't think Democrats are, they fill the slate. So y'all, if you're not supporting our Democrats, you're missing out. And if you want to know how to be a great district chair, <laughs> see Christine Bohm. She's a Jersey girl. She don't play. She don't play. But if you are a candidate and you need some resources, some technical resources, some audio video, that 30, 60, 90 second ad, feel free to reach out to Black Pro IT Solutions. We have everything you need. We can create. Now, listen, I don't have drones. I don't, I don't do drones, but I do have some nice backdrops and we can shoot it, edit it and get you out there so that you can share your message with the people. And the beautiful part about the work that I do, I'm not in this to make money. I'm in this to elect more Democrats. So my, my fee structure is very, very, very reasonable. So holla at your girl, scan the QR code, and let's talk about how we can help you with your campaign. All right. Y'all know I get excited when it's Who's Your Women Forward Month. Or who's your women forward week on turn left? I don't know of another organization that that is so committed to making sure we have hundreds, if not thousands, of women across our state ready to lead. On our show tonight, the executive director of Who's Your Women Forward, Amy Lavander, and her trusty, trusty other Amy sidekick, I say that in love because she ain't nobody's sidekick, <laughs> program director Amy Schwartz. Welcome to the show, Amy's. Thank you, Thanks, Dana. Dana. <laughs> so talk about it. You guys wanted to come and talk about Who's Your Women Forward. Why is this week so important that we discuss Who's Your Women Forward? We are less than one week from the deadline for applications for class six. And so we wanna make sure that all uh, Democrat women leaders over the age of 25 know that the application season is open, um, that they'll c consider applying to become part of this amazing statewide network of engaged women leaders around the state. I love it. I love it. And uh, for those who are interested in applying and or donating to Who's Your Women Forward, the link is right there in the Facebook page, right there. So click on it. Every woman that's listening, you need to go ahead and apply. So talk about the program and how does this actually help prepare women to be leaders uh, in our state? Yeah, sure. So Who's Your Women Forward is a women's civic and political leadership program. So it's important to note we are not a candidate uh, training program. There are a lot of organizations doing amazing work out there that's really more focused on that. What we really focus on is the journey for women leaders um, to help them really uh, bring forth and bring to the uh, surface the qualities we already know they have um, by virtue of being in the program. They've already shown leadership equalities in their communities um, at, 
And um, what we want to do is help them to find that confidence to know that the time is right for them to do whatever it is that they have their sights set on as a goal. We have about a third of the women um, who are, uh, come through our program run for office. About another third engage in the political party or campaign structure, meaning they're in positions of leadership in county or district um, parties or work uh, for individual campaigns. And then another third who are uh, leaders in the philanthropic and corporate communities and take the skills that they learn um, and enhance really through our uh, not a 10 month leadership program back to their own communities um, to seek that promotion um, to go serve on that board um, or engage in various ways in their communities. Amy, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, um, we are here, Hoosier Women Forward is here as a program to really help people discover what their own goals are and then build a network of women around you to help meet whatever goal it is. Um, so there's no one path or one way to be successful through Hoosier Women Forward. It's finding what you want to do in your community and then giving you the network of people to help you get that done. I love it. And so That's this great. is this is class six. I mean, can I ask you guys, when we were all sitting in that conference room, <laughs> did we ever think that we would, I mean, did we imagine we would have so many amazing women coming through this program? <laughs> We certainly hoped that they would come out and step forward and raise their hands, and they sure have. Absolutely. I mean, I think about Cynthia Johnson, who is the fifth district chair. You know, I, I, she talks about how she never thought that she would be in a position or was qualified to be in the position of leading an entire district. She went through your program and she was she felt empowered. Tell us more about some of those stories that that you guys are receiving from the alumni. Yeah, it's, um, I think the most impactful and powerful thing that Amy and I see is when we get a note and we get them regularly from uh, either current class participants or alumni that say, I just want to let you know that without Hoosier Women Forward, I probably wouldn't have stepped into that um, and filed for a political office or pursued that promotion, but because of the confidence, the network, the skills I know I have, I was, I realized I was ready and I was qualified and I was going to do it. And that to me just speaks volumes to the um, quality of the applicants that we have and the um, quality of the programming that we provide. And so it's, you know, communication, it's um, talking about raising money, not just as a candidate, but, you know, for any woman in a leadership position, you're going to be on a board or you're going to be um, serving an organization and you're going to need to raise money. And that's one of the things that I think women um, don't do as well only because they don't know how to do it, I think more so. Um, and once you start, you know, you have a strategy and a plan for engagement. It's not this scary thing, but really mm -hmm. a manageable um, effort. And so through some of that skills development, I think really you, we watch these women come into their own. You know, the other thing that I think is really unique is that we look at it as each class day is really that time for an individual to come in for six and a half hours um, for a program day, put their phones down, leave their family obligations at the door, leave their work obligations at the door, and really to focus on themselves to say, what is it that I see myself doing in the next, you know, six months? six years um, down the road, and what are some steps I can start to put into place to, to get on that path to achieve them? I love it. Now, okay, not every woman is getting in. How many applications do you guys get every year? Well, I will say that it's a very competitive process and that for many of our class members, they have applied more than once before they get into the program. So if you don't get in, it's not because we don't love you and we want you to come back and apply again. Um, it's just the virtue of the competitive nature and the small number of spots that we have open uh, in any class year. I love it. One of the things that you guys are intentional about is diversity. And I don't mean just diversity of race and ethnicity, but there's also a diversity of geography. Talk about why that is so important to the program. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, the Democrat Party is a big tent. We've got rural, we've got urban, um, we have a lot of commonality of interests and issues that we're all addressing. 
but in each area, those issues manifest themselves in different ways locally. And so it's really important for us, like with any um, program, we don't want just a bunch of people from central Indiana because we know our state's bigger. And so to win statewide, we have to cultivate and engage people from, you know, outstate, as we call it here in central Indiana, um, to make sure that we understand the issues they're seeing in their communities and um, the solutions that they're bringing to their communities so that we can work collaboratively together to sort of find a path forward. Um, Amy, you want to add anything? Yeah, exactly. And one of the things that's been so exciting recently is, you know, because we've had more and more classes come through, we're starting to kind of get critical mass in areas that aren't Indianapolis. Um, so we're getting, you know, some of the smaller cities in Indiana um, you know, we're start starting to have, you know, 8, 10, 12 women, and they're connecting and finding each other, even if they weren't in the same program year, and they're building things together in their communities, using that strength of being connected from Hoosier Women Forward. Um, so it's really exciting to see things kind of start to bubble to the surface. That is really exciting because, again, people always feel like they're in a silo and they're all alone mm -hmm. and that we're not connected. And now we, you guys are literally crafting and creating a leadership network to move Indiana forward. Uh, so w what what do you uh, get the uh, Give us a little idea of, of some of the program days without going in. You know, you don't have to give everything, but so what, what's, what happens in a program day? Well, we um, usually have a, to some, a general topic or learning object objectives we want to get out of a day. For instance, you know, again, we do a communications day that's really everything from social media to media relations to, um, build, you know, building your own brand and sustaining that um, through, uh, you know, social network engagement. Um, and so we try to have guest speakers come in, but then we've also tried to be really thoughtful about adding in class time. So either through activities that allow the class to engage with each other or through um, some social time throughout the day, because we also, as important as the learning is, it's also that connectivity of the classmates. And so we um, always want feedback from our classes. So we have an evaluation every um, class period. And so we always hear we want more time to engage with each other. And so we've pivoted a little bit of our programming to try to be more intentional about that so that you're getting sort of a good mix of both of those things, recognizing that it six and a half hours goes really fast. Really fast. When you've got a big pool of uh, amazing speakers to pick from on any topic. Yeah, yeah. And I got to tell you, go ahead and dangle that that one carrot that that at the end of the year, where do y'all go? We may or may not go to Washington, D.C. for three days. Uh Oh, I was the carrot. I was I, uh, OK. <laughs> well, skip that part. Oops. Oh, <laughs> my bad. Um, but there is what we ask women to apply. But talk about their what, what their time requirements are so they know what how yes. much they have to give. So it's one class day a month um, starting in August. And then uh, we do not meet in November uh, due to the election cycles. We just, it's a really busy time for everybody. And then um, we do culminate with a three-day trip in April um, to D.C. And then a final last program day in May um, where we have a graduation ceremony and celebration at the end of that class day. Uh, all right. So, guys, this is a great opportunity, um, but I think it's important for you to know exactly what is expected of you. You have to show up. <laughs> you don't just, you know, right. you, the, 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 the uh, application. Tell them about the application process so they know how it works so they can fill it all out. Yeah. So if you go to HoosierWomenForward.org slash apply, you'll see all the requirements there. Um, there is a little form to fill out. And then we ask for a couple of community sponsor references as well. Um, and where to send all that information is included on the website. Um, and then our um, amazing board members uh, spend the summer looking at those applications, making some really difficult decisions just because there's only so many spots we have every year. Um, and then typically right at the beginning of August, we announce our new group of people. I love it. Now, OK, the one thing about this organization, I think you understand, everyone needs to understand the women who go through this program become winners. If they run for office, they pretty much have a good chance of winning. If they run for a, a county seat or, or county 
a, a, a district chair, county chair role, they usually win because these women are now prepared to be leaders. Guys, go ahead and give us one last pitch. I'm not going to hold y'all. I just I get excited about who is your woman forward. I, I love it. I am here for it every year. So give that last pitch. Yeah, so we, um, if you'd like to become a part of this, uh, a network of over 100 women statewide, we've got 111 alumni, and we'll be recruiting and selecting our ne next class of up to 24 women to really um, engage and change the face of not only Indiana po uh, politics, but of Indiana leadership structures in both the philanthropic and corporate arenas. We are your gals, um, and this program is for you. We, um, one of the th unique things one of our alumni said the other day is when you walk in, it's not a competition, but it is a, it is a co collaborative team environment. And so we welcome everyone to be there. Everyone's rooting for your success. We support and lift up each other in your successes that you have, not only when you come into the program, but um, as you continue through the program and into the future. Um, and as Dana said, you know, like we're winners, um, we have over 70% of our women who have stepped up and run for office have won. And that's in both red and blue states or cities, <laughs> red and blue counties. counties. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's all right. And one other little thing is you may or may not get the opportunity to spend some time with Dana Black during our program year. She's always one of our highest rated uh, speakers that we have. And so you don't want to miss your opportunity to get the real Dana Black, <laughs> Indiana's own. That is so sweet. Y'all, click on the link, apply. Even if you don't want to apply, donate, because it does take money to create and cultivate this organization. So please consider giving a couple of dollars uh, or something. A, a, a little bit goes a long way. And I promise you, if you decide to apply, your life will change for the better because we are moving Indiana forward one class at a time. All right, Amy's, I'm, you are free. You are free to go and enjoy the rest of your Thursday. Thank you so much for sharing with the Turn Left listeners everything that Hoosier Man Forward is doing. I am so proud um, that I get to collaborate and work with you guys. You guys motivate me to be better every day. So thank you very much for all you do. Thank you, Dana. Dana. All right, take Have care, guys. Evening. Take care. Thank you. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. I love it, love it. Now, guys, whoo, you got to get signed up. You got to do the thing. Uh, but definitely, definitely, if you are a woman who is interested in being in a leadership role, you're interested in doing some things differently in your community and, and you're not really sure how to begin, just sign up for Who's Your Women Forward. You'll get going in the right direction. And since we're talking about empowering women, whoo, so... I remember the first time I had a chance to meet her in pub person and she just blew me away because I was already a groupie from reading her blog posts. Uh, she, she does not hold back. I'm going to read just a brief, brief little bit of her bio because I want you guys to understand the significance of the individual that I am bringing on right now. Uh, Sheila Kennedy is an emeritus professor of law and public policy at the School of Public and Environmental Affairs at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis. Until her retirement in December of 2020, she was a faculty fellow with both the Center of Religion and American Culture and the Tobias Center for Leadership Excellence and an adjunct professor of political science and founder of the Center for Civic Literacy at IUPUI. Professor Kennedy holds a BS from Indiana University and received her JD with honors from from IU in 1975, where she was managing editor of the Indiana Law Review. She practiced real estate, administrative, and business law in Indianapolis, first at Baker and Daniels, and later as a partner in Mears, Crawford, Kennedy, and Eccles, and I probably said that wrong, and served as corporate, corporation counsel for the city of Indianapolis from 1977 to 1980. Y'all, when I tell you we talking to a for real, for real homegrown legend, Someone who's cut her teeth and ain't afraid to say it. Y'all give it up to my next guest. And we're going to talk about her book, but let's get to know who she is first. Y'all give it up for Sheila Kennedy. Welcome to the show, Miss Sheila. Thank you so much for all that kind, kind words. There are those who would not have been so kind. <laughs> Honey, we don't worry about them. See, over here on <laughs> okay. Turn Left, it's all about love. We start with love. If you start with love, everything else will turn out all right. Well, okay. Sheila, you know, I read a little bit about your education and some of your career, but tell the people who you are and where you come from. 
Well, unfortunately or fortunately, I am an Indiana person born and bred. I was <laughs> born in Indianapolis, raised in Anderson, came back to Indianapolis after college, and as you pointed out, went to uh, IU Law School. Uh, I And I've been here. I, I uh, was corporation counsel back when I was a Republican, and I was a Republican when Republicans were still sane, <laughs> which is a while back now. Um, I, uh, I became a Democrat in 2000 because, uh, well, you all know why. Yeah, because, we know what happened. And, yeah, and- uh, Some trauma I, we don't have to relive. That's right. And I, I for six years, I ran the Indiana uh, affiliate of the ACLU. Oh. And uh, then I went to the university and for 22 years I taught law and public policy and media and public affairs. And so I, I, I'm glad that you mentioned that you were a former Republican, because right now, as Democrats, we have a former Republican on the on the ballot or looking to be on the ballot in 2024 um, to represent Democrats for governor. And that's uh, uh, Jennifer. Uh, yeah. yeah. Jennifer McCormick. Talk to us as Democrats on how we need to learn to embrace her um, as a, a Democrat since she switched parties. I think that's an important conversation. I think it's important, and I am. I I have not met her personally. I have really, really admired her. I admired her when she was uh, the education person, still a Republican, mm -hmm. and I particularly admired her when she stood up to our crazy legislature and said, "You know, you're not doing the right thing by the students in our state," which is one of my hot button issues. And I will apologize in advance for tomorrow's post about that. Uh, but she, you know, there are two kinds of people who are in political parties, Dana. There are the people who choose a team, view the whole thing as if it's football or baseball or whatever. And my team right or wrong, you know, I've never been that kind of a person. I I can tell that Jennifer McCormick is not that kind of person. And and there are a lot of former Republicans in right in this town right now. My husband and I met in a Republican administration. Mm. Uh we stood still philosophically. I got to tell you when I ran for Congress as a Republican in 1980 and lost to Andy Jacobs by not a lot but I lost. Uh, people came up to me afterward and said, well, you know, Sheila, you're just so conservative. I couldn't, I, you know, I have stood still and I am now a communist <laughs> because the, the world has changed. Mm -hmm. And what was a responsible political party no longer exists. It is now a white nationalist cult and it scares me to death. Wow. And I will tell you, because I'm a very old woman. Uh, seasoned. I, seasoned. Oh, big, seasoned. Seasoned. Oh, that's that's nice a, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Especially with all that salt and pepper, baby. We call it seasoning now. <laughs> I like that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to adopt that. But the people I worked with when I was a Republican are all voting Democrat now. Wow. wow. I mean, we, look, we sit there and look at each other and say, what happened to, to the adult party, whether you agreed with it, you know, in terms of policy or not, this, it's really frightening right now. Yeah. And one of the things that we talk about, I mean, I am so glad that I came after the two Amy's because I, this book. <laughs> yeah, we're going to talk about it. Yeah, I want to talk about it. The argument, basically, it's a little book. It's 80 pages. Buy it. It's easy to read. You know, the the argument is that women are going to save this country. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's why being on with the two Amy's seems to me to be so appropriate. Because with the, with the advent of the Dobbs decision, all of a sudden, in my view, all politics has changed. Mm -hmm. the, the, the last uh, the last chapter in this book is is titled 
when mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Baby. And I am absolutely convinced that, let me back up a minute. For years and years, the, the right wing that wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, that tried to overrule Roe v. Wade, mm -hmm. they were single issue voters. Nothing else mattered. They were going to vote on the basis of abortion. Meanwhile, Democrats, liberals, and at one time, uh, Republicans for choice, which was a group I was in back when there were mm -hmm. there were Republicans for mm -hmm. choice. Uh, you know, we said, well, you know, we've got Roe v. Wade. We're going to always be able to access uh, reproductive choice. Uh, and we really care about the environment and we care about uh, this gay rights, whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we were not one one issue voters. Mm -hmm. I think that all changed with Dobbs. Mm -hmm. Let me let me tell you a little bit about what led to this book. Uh, my friend Morton Marcus came to me. This was before Dobbs came down. He came to me and he said, you know, I would like to write a book with you about women's progress. And Morton, for those of you who know him, like bathes in data. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's an economist. His interest was to see how technology and other kinds of uh, innovations had allowed women to escape what was actually the status of property. Because that's what the, the book is called from property to partner. Okay. Because women were essentially the property of their husbands or fathers. And his interest was, you know, okay, now you've got washing machines and, and sewing machines, and this allowed women to get out of the house. Mm -hmm. And I in our initial conversations, I pointed out that the most important innovation was the pill. Mm -hmm. Because without the ability of a woman to control her own reproduction, she cannot become a political actor. She cannot become an economic actor. Mm -hmm. She is stuck in that property, you know, status. Right, right. So that was always going to be part of, of our story. But then Dobbs came down. Yeah. And, and the focus of the book changed a bit because... What we what we did was examine the effect on American women of the. I mean, this has never happened before when a constitutional right that was part of the structure of society fifty some years is suddenly withdrawn. That has never happened before. Right. And, what? Go well, ahead. I was going to say, you know, I, I that particular the Dobbs decision definitely reversed a lot of things. But I think this particular st Supreme Court has actually been trending that way because they oh, they yeah. kind of gutted the, the the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act uh, in 20. So that at the same time that they were giving us uh, gay folks the right to marry, they were saying that the states could go ahead and gerrymander the hell out of their, their districts and and carve out, you know, exceptions so that they can um, reduce in, uh, the impact of the black vote so I, I but Dobbs was like that like okay we just gonna go all in even after they lied and said that they weren't gonna do that that's I think the yeah. part that is most painful is that y'all lied well and and those in the gay community who don't think they're next uh -uh. need to realize that the uh people who are on that court today are not the people who uh who said that the constitution requires re uh the uh, gay gay marriage absolutely I mean, marriage absolutely you know, the, the the shift to an ideological right wing has been really stunning and there are all sorts of things that this court is doing that are in my view anti-environment anti-gay anti-woman and you know, it it is really um, we're at a, at what I I like to call a, a, a pivot point in American democracy. And you mentioned 
gerrymandering, which is one of my other hot buttons. <laughs> I mean, for the court to to say that they did not have the right to um, interfere and and say that gerrymandering was unconstitutional was simply dishonest. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and what it does, of course, is make it much harder for Democrats. All of most cities in this country, I believe that it's over 500,000, are deep blue. Rural areas are red. Mm -hmm. I mean, the only reason we don't have a hot uh, civil war right now, I think, is because geographically yeah. it's kind of hard. Absolutely. But, but the between the gerrymandering and now control of the court by an ideologically rigid right wing cabal, Ooh. we're at a, we're at a, an inflection point. Absolutely, and and I think women have to get. And what we've seen is that every time a state has had the opportunity on the ballot mm -hmm. to affirm women's autonomy. Mm -hmm. Even in Kentucky and Kansas, that has happened. Absolutely. Unfortunately, in Indiana, the only people who can who are able to have any effect on gerrymandering are the people who benefit from it. Absolutely. So we are, if you will excuse the expression, screwed. Absolutely. We need a national the the uh, bills that have not passed John John Lewis's bill. Yep. Outlaw gerrymandering would have been that's what Indiana needs. Absolutely. But in the meantime, women have to go to the polls and and vote out these men who are so terrified to what we've got old white Christian guys who look at black people, look at women look at gay people and say, well, this, you know, that's not the world I was promised. Exactly. And they are using all of the mechanisms that exist in order to turn back the clock. Absolutely. Indiana's own Dana Black. We are talking to Sheila Kennedy, the co-author of From Property to Partner, Women's Progress and Political uh, Resistance. You know, you, you have a lawyer's mind. And we were talking about the Supreme Court. We we're talking about one of the things that we would, in order for us to be able to vote on women's reproductive rights in Indiana like they did in Kansas, is to have an uh, Indiana constitutional amendment, which we know that's yeah. never going to happen. Um, talk about how not just, it's not just that we show up to vote, but that we need to talk to these lawmakers and stay in their faces and then hold them accountable, not just in the state house here in Indianapolis, but sometimes we got to show up in the in the district that they live in. Yeah, it right now, I think it's safe to say that Republicans at every level, municipal, state and national are among other things, anti-choice. Mm -hmm. uh, but, it, it, you know, you, you say I have a lawyer's mind. I There is a doctrine that was first really enunciated back 1967 uh, called um, due pro well, substantive due process. And what that really means, that, that sounds very jargony and lawyerly. Substantive due process is recognition that there are things that the government ought not do. Mm -hmm. In other words, that there is a line that has been drawn essentially by the Bill of Rights that puts a, a barrier between decisions that are properly left to individuals and decisions that are proper for government. I will tell you that the most hypocritical thing I could think of was all of these, well, I'll, I'll watch my language, all of the people. I love who, it. I, I love the energy. And keep, you know, bring it, bring it. Well, you know, the, these assholes who didn't want to wear masks and right. said government was exceeding its authority to have them, you know, 
the, well, the, you know, who, Sheila, on that one, when they the, everybody was cool with wearing masks until they found out who was disproportionately impacted by the disease and who was dying from it. And once they realized it was more brown and black people, simply because they were the folks who were t more typically in those essential roles where they had oh. to be out um, and, you know, they had a, a little bit lower of an income and maybe they didn't have the insurance, you know, because, heck, we even had a doctor who was a whole doctor was begging these people for care and they weren't listening to her. But once they found out who was actually dying, it everything changed. Everything went from, you know, the science of it to, oh, it ain't us, so we ain't got to worry about it. But getting back, I mean, legally, we expect government to keep us safe. Yes. If you are acting or I am acting in a way that is harming someone else, then it is appropriate for government to come in and say, no, you shouldn't do that. When I am deciding who I want to marry or how many children I have, I'm not harming anybody Nobody. else. And the government should butt out at that point. That's what substantive due process really meant, that there are decisions that I used to, in my classes, I would teach my students that the Bill of Rights is really a list of things that government can't do. The, the question with abortion isn't whether people should abort or not. It's who should be making that decision. And under 57 years of jurisprudence, the court had always said, that's not a decision for the government to make. That's a decision for uh, women and their significant others and their doctors. You know, that, but, but then the same people who say, oh, no, government has a right to come into your uterus, those people oh but government doesn't have a right to make me wear a mask or take I mean, my gun or take my ar-15 oh, don't even go with the gun i can go there i mean i'm telling you sheila let's do this this is this is a joy for me to have you on the show because you are a wealth of knowledge that if, if people who don't follow you and don't know who you are they're missing a gym you know you well, were thank you you were you were around uh very conscious pre roe v wade now you are here post dobbs um, as a woman who is very seasoned and and has has enjoyed a a a, a really good a, a decent life, I don't know, you know, I, I don't know. Just because you have a law degree, don't mean you have a great life. But you've had a wonderful <laughs> life, right? Yes. What has the transition been like to go from okay, it's completely illegal, it's legal, to now Dobbs? H how does that how does that emotion set with you? I will tell you that when I was in high school, I knew girls who died from coat hanger abortions. I mean, you know, they, when when people say Dobbs does not get rid of abortion, what it does is get rid of safe, medically appropriate abortion. That's what happens. Back alleys will come again, you know. The, the Dobbs decision in a very strange way, I think it energizes me mm. because what it does is make very clear what half of America, the women's half, is facing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was so easy during the time <laughs> that the court was right. <laughs> you know, uh, it was so easy to not engage with the underlying reasons that women's auto bodily autonomy is so important. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, a lot of people for whom this was not a front burner issue have wakened up. So I'm, you know, my argument is we're going to get this country back online and it's going to be women who do it. Absolutely. I, I, I was literally watching uh, Morning Joe the other day and, and uh, Caddy Kay has a new book out as well, talking about how basically women are less likely to be uh, corrupted <laughs> as our male counterparts. And so if you want to get corruption out, you need more women. But let's 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 focus in on this book, because now I'm, uh, everybody, if you want the book again, the link is right there. You can go ahead. First of all, you should be following her. Follow her blog because she's amazing. But go ahead and get the book. Uh, I am actually going to purchase the book uh, so that I can have it and, and read it. Um, I just didn't get a chance to this time. I was on vacation. Um, let's talk. Vacations are important. <laughs> and, I, you know, now if I had bought it, my my partner, Nicole, would have read it in like 15 minutes. She goes through. She 
reads books like people breathe. So I should have gotten it and had to give me the cliff notes. But let's <laughs> let's talk about your book. First, um, you're, this is not your first book. I see you have quite a few yeah, items on your... Is on your book list. Yeah, this is my 10th book. Wow. And I will also tell you that this one, uh, Morton and I did through Kindle Direct Publishing oh. because all of my prior books have been either through a uh, trade public publisher or an academic publisher, and not one of them did diddly squat wow. about marketing. And, you know, when you put your heart and soul into a book, this, this is a small book, but I I have some that are a lot more substantial. And when you've worked for a year on a book and the publisher says, yeah, that's a good book and we'll put it in our catalog and does nothing else. Wow. It, it's really annoying. Well, sister, so, I'm here to tell you, we can shoot, we can do whatever you need to do to advertise right. and market your, this book or any other book. And then we can create, <laughs> that, that's the joy. We're talking about technology in the book. That's what technology does. These publishers are either gonna get on board or we're not gonna use them because there's ways for us to get what we need without having to ha go to the gatekeeper, right? Literally, yeah. I'm, I'm a prime example. I am a, I'm a talker. I have always wanted to do this kind of work of interviewing and having conversations, but I, a, I didn't have the education and nobody was, and I, I don't I, look real talk. I don't look like what they really want. Right. So I don't need you. <laughs> I can do it myself. I got a technical background so we can do that. We can, talk, we can, we can set up something and we can uh, do a 30 second and run it and get you some sales. But that that sounds great. But, you know, Dana, everything you just said is so important. And that's why when the Internet first came on the scene, I was so excited. But there is, as we now know, a dark side to this. Absolutely. And that is that the people who like the former guy uh, and who listened to Fox News and, it, you know, all of a sudden our information environment allows people to live in bubbles, bubbles. of their own construction. Mm -hmm. You know, they go out and they, you know, you really don't believe that men walked on the moon. I used to, t I used to tell my students, <laughs> if they really believe that the aliens landed in Roswell, I can find them five internet sites with pictures of the aliens. Wow. Okay. You know, I mean, so we've all got to be our own curators. Absolutely. We all have to know who is credible, and who is not? And common sense ain't so common no more. I mean, no. that was that's what my mama used to always tell me. Because some things people don't want to uh, use their own common sense; they just believe what somebody else tells them. But let's be, let's get back to this book because I'm I'm excited about it. Talk yeah, talk thanks. about um, the research that went into creating and, and and putting this book together. Well, the in my my chapters and and. Morton's chapters are different. Morton has all the uh, the data on how many women work and how you know. I mean, there there's a lot mm -hmm. of of good data in here. I I looked at the roots uh, of I want to of misogyny actually. Mm, okay. Uh, and a lot of those roots are religious. Mm. Uh, so I took a look at where these notions of women's proper role actually came from. Mm -hmm. So the book discusses, let me just, I'll give you the, the chapter names and a brief uh, description. Okay, that sounds the, good. The first chapter is just an overview of what's coming. The second one is patriarchy and the culture war. Mm -hmm. And that, that is a sort of deep dive into the primarily, but not exclusively religious roots of misogyny and the belief that women uh, are subservient or ought to be subservient to men. But there's also a recognition that, look, until we could control our own reproduction, mm -hmm. women, overall are not as strong as men there right. are stronger women yeah. some yeah. women are stronger and some but but basically and when back in the day when most 
uh, jobs required physical strength and required and and women were popping out babies you know it, there's good reason why women were not able to compete with men in the workplace or in in politics and when you add to that religious doctrines that said women should be subservient uh, the man should run the household and, and I want to make it very clear there are several uh, religions that were never like that right so I've gone through you know which ones to avoid right but uh, but between the very real physiological changes and the fact that women could not control their pregnancy people didn't even even in when I was much younger and entered when I was in law school I mean people didn't hire women or mm -hmm. employers didn't because if you were in childbearing years, years. Mm -hmm. they didn't know you're going to be pregnant next week and you're going to be gone and you know that there were sound reasons for that and those reasons uh went away when women could control if and when they had children so mm -hmm. you you could hire a woman who was in her fertile years and uh have some uh con understanding that she could control she can plan yeah sure, she can plan absolutely and um uh, that i am absolutely convinced that the problem that so many men especially have with uh abortion and birth control because birth control is on on the mm -hmm. mark too is because they want women back in the kitchen barefoot and pregnant. It is anti-woman. It is not pro-baby. See, I I don't know if I I don't know what it would have happened to me in a, in a different time in a different era, even as a child who was born in 1970. I'm not like a, a millennial. I'm a Gen Xer, and. I would have fits with my my parents because they were trying to tell me how I should be as a female, but none of the things that they were telling me made sense to me, and it, and it wasn't my thing. I don't. I I never could understand why people, and mostly in this patriarchy that we're talking about, do not allow women to be the kind of woman they choose to be, not the woman that you think they should be. And that to me is especially. I mean, forget forget. I mean, I'm a masculine presenting woman on top of all of that, but I never understood that. And it actually permeates a whole lot of different things. Why Why does your perception of who I should be mean that I have to be that way? I don't know what I would have done in a different time, in a different era, where I couldn't do what was in my mind to do versus what you're telling me to do. The other thing that is point 1970, my God, you're a child. <laughs> Uh, Thank you for that. I'll take it. Happy birthday to me, 53. <laughs> but, the, you know, the, the culture has moved on. Mm -hmm. And the people who want to push women back to the 1950s, to barefoot pregnant, all that, it, it, are fighting a losing battle. Yeah. Because today, once a woman has said to herself, I'm going to be the woman I want to be, the woman I think, I am. She's not going back. You're not going back. Uh, when I went to law school, people told me my children would all be on drugs. Oh my uh, God. <laughs> what a horrible thing to say. Yeah. You know, none of now one went bad, he became a lawyer. But other than that, <laughs> they're pretty good. No, I mean, I mean, it's just, it was so, you know, I remember a, uh, my sister's brother-in-law was told me why well, you're taking the place of a man you know in, in when i went back to law school he now has a daughter who's a lawyer uh you know <laughs> the, the society has moved on mm -hmm. and they i am absolutely convinced that the people who are fighting this battle are fighting a rear guard action but it's what you have been saying all along. It's what, what the Amy said. Women have to get out there. We have to vote. We have to make sure that everybody is registered to vote. Absolutely. Because all of the data seems to show that 
these victories that Democrats and pro, pro-choice movements are having are significantly because new people who have not previously voted have come to the polls. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. we need to get out there and make sure that every woman we know is registered. And and you're not saying like for those women who want to be homemakers and want to, Ooh, you know, you're not saying it's anything wrong with it. What you're suggesting is let people be and do what they want to do. Choice means choice. Maybe you want 15 kids. Fine. If you can afford it, go for it. Absolutely. You know, maybe you don't want any. If that's your choice, it's the bottom line is it's none of government's business. Absolutely. You get to make the choice of your life, what philosophers call your telos, your the end uh, goals of your life. That's not something for government to determine. It's for each individual to determine until and unless you are harming the person or property of someone else. Absolutely. And then we see uh, every year the Republican GOP all over the the nation and at the federal level are introducing ways to not help families. Um, They want to defund public education and privatize that. They want to privatize Medicare and Medicaid. They want to make it so that we have to. I actually am not a lot of my Democratic people may feel some kind of way about it. They want to raise the, the retirement age for Social Security. Honestly, we're living longer. So I, it's so I've met some seventy-three-year-olds that are, you know, there are legitimate yeah arguments yeah. that we can make. But they don't take if care of the family. The goal is to help people. You know, I used to, my my sense was back in the day before you were even born <laughs> that the arguments tended to be okay. How do we keep babies from starving? Well, if we do it this way, it's going to have a bad. It's going to interfere with the market. Maybe we need to do it that way. Those are legitimate arguments. Mm-hmm. It, but today it's, well, let the baby die. Yeah. I mean, you know, I have never seen this much meanness mm-hmm. from a political party. I mean, mm. it is appalling. And mm. you're right. I mean, maybe it's time to raise the retirement age a little, although different jobs take different, you know. But Right, right. But it's a that's an argument that rational, reasonable people can have. What is not a rational argument is let's get rid of Social Security. Yeah. Let's get rid of Medicare. Or let's put it on the market because we know how well that oh. goes every oh, yeah. eight well, to ten next years. Next time I'm going to have a heart attack, I'm going to go shopping for my dog. Oh my! And I don't even understand that philosophy. Like, you know, I don't understand why I have to search so hard to get medical care. Why? Why do I have to do that? And oh, by the way, why don't we just get rid of the insurance companies while we at it? And let me just, you know, let me get billed directly from the doctor. Then I don't have to worry about the premiums. And then me and doctor can make out work out the payment arrangements. And he, you know, what I'm saying like, uh, there's so many different ways uh, uh, on how we can be a better society that just, we just refuse to do it. We are the only. Uh, Western industrialized nation without national health care. Yeah. And I, I wrote about this last week on my blog. I mean, it's just, yeah, we, and we are not number one. We are number 38 in terms of our outcomes. And we are number one in what we spend. I mean, it, the, the United States spends so much money on health care for such poor results wow you would but anyway that's that's a that's a deep dive another time yeah that's a deep dive you know (laughs) indiana's own dana black talking to professor yes the professor was here today sheila kennedy co-author of from property to partner women's progress and political resistance this has been an honor for me to sit and I, i listen listen real talk you know um there are women who inspire me to to do what I do. Um, I like, I like your guts. There are some women who, and not everybody is the same and we get that. Like not every, all personalities are the same, but wh- I have to be honest and say, reading your work inspired me to say, I can write what I feel. I can write the truth. I can write. And so when I write in the Indianapolis business journal, every now and then the editor will come back and say, well, you can't call Michael Clark a liar. Okay. <laughs> Fine, but he is, but he is <laughs> right. But I, and I understood what she meant when she. <laughs> I understood what she meant when she said she was like Dana. We can't, we can't call Michael Clark a liar. Really? 
Okay. Well, I mean, but, but guys, this is what, what networking with women and what we can do is all about. We had the Amy's on earlier talking about who's human forward. Now we have a 10 time published author, Sheila Kennedy, who was teaching young people, molding young minds to be good law thinkers, to be good legal minds, talking to little old Indiana's own, um, and sharing the joy of writing guys, get her book, get Please. her <laughs> book, get it. And you know what? Don't let this be the last time we chat on turn left. I want to bring you back on. Let's, let's chop Anytime. it up. Absolutely. Let's chop it up sometime because I would love to dive into, you know, how you feel about, um, the anti CRT movement. I would love to know your oh. thoughts on, yes. you know, the immigration. There's so many things I would love to talk to you about. We were focused on your book tonight and I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to share that. Um, tell the people again, um, where they can find you. I know I put the link out there, but are you, do you it's on Amazon. Just if you go to me, uh, just Sheila Kennedy, or if you go to from property to partner. Right. Love it. Love it. Guys, Indiana's all day in a black. Let me do a quick uh, Bones Unique Boutique. Don't go anywhere. Okay. Today's show is brought to you by Bones Unique Boutique. Click on the QR code. And for all Turn Left listeners, you can get a 10% discount on your order by using the code DEMOCRAT. Be sure to visit www.bomesuniqueboutique.com. I do love Bones Unique Boutique. Okay, now check this out, everybody. This is Big D win Weekend. This is Big Dem Weekend. If you have your ticket to the HH Dinner, I will see you there. But more importantly... You have seen the attacks in our LGBTQ plus community. You have seen how they have attacked trans youth. I mean, literally stigmatizing young people to the point of we don't know what, right? Where parents are going, what am I going to do? I've already started gender affirming care for my child. We may have to leave. So we at Indiana Stonewall Democrats, all we do is try to help elect more Democrats who are either LGBTQ plus themselves or are strong allies. And this weekend, if you have not already done so, if you're hanging out, you're coming to the HH dinner, just stay one more night and come on over to Cafe Patichu, where we will hear from the amazing former mayor of Houston, Texas, president and CEO of the Victory Institute and Victory Fund, my uh, one another one of my groupie people, uh, Mayor Anise Parker. She is going to talk about how we can empower ourselves in this climate of hate. She's going to give you the message that you need to not be in the closet, but to come on out and stand strong, even our allies. If you're an ally, I need you to stand beside me, not behind me. Stand beside me and let's go through it together. But the only way we can help these folks get elected is to raise money. And all of our contributions, every ticket that we sell, every sponsorship we sell at Indiana Stonewall Democrats will go towards our endorsed candidates. So so please, if you haven't already, get yourself a ticket and it's a good time, right? You're going to have a good time Friday night. You're going to have a good time and just be all about that Democratic love all weekend long. Guys, Indiana's on Dana Black turn left. This has been an awesome, awesome show. I hope you guys got as much out of it as I did. Sheila, I am going to see you in cyberspace. I'm going to keep stalking you. That's great. <laughs> I stalk, I stalk, I just stalk your blogs. I stalk your blogs. I'll put, let me make that clear. Cause people be like, for real. Tune in next week. I'm not even sure it's on the show next week, but I got a show next week. But tune in where we talk about Indiana politics from the left side of things. We're going to start gearing things up. We're going to get through the summer, summer months, but these candidates still need your help. Uh, every show is a fundraiser for you to help these candidates so that you can donate to them, okay? So Indiana's on, Dana Black, turn left. I will holler at y'all next week. Peace. Turn Left is the property of Black Pearl IT Solutions. Executive producer, Indiana's own Dana Black. Music by www.binsound.com.